Larry Cohen, the director of the Center for Austrian Studies, and at least I'm back this year. Uh, and it's a special pleasure and a privilege uh, to uh, convene this 30th installment of the annual Robert Kahn Memorial Lecture uh, in Austrian Studies. And to offer some words of welcome, let me bring forward the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, John Coleman, uh, who's a professor also in the Political Science Department, and joined us uh, just this last, late this last summer. So uh, he's not completely unpacked yet. Uh, yeah, at home, I suspect. John? <coughs> Well, what Gary says is literally true because when the weather turned, I realized I had no gloves because they're packed in a box deep in a garage in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, that turned out to be a bit of a problem the last few, uh, last few weeks. Uh, so uh, thank you all for, for being here, as Gary said. Uh, I am John Coleman. I'm the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. I arrived here back in uh, early August. And on behalf of the entire college, I would like to welcome you to the 30th Annual Kahn Memorial Lecture. The Kahn Lectures were established in 1984 to honor the work and legacy of Robert A. Kahn, a Viennese scholar who fled the nationalist socialist threat in Austria and came to the United States in 1939. We are particularly honored uh, today to have his daughter, Marilyn Kahn McElroy, here with us, sitting over here. Can you please join me in welcoming <laughs> Khan completed his PhD at Columbia and was a member of a then little known research center called the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study before joining the faculty of Rutgers in 1947. He would ultimately become the leading authority on the evolution of ethnic tensions within the Habsburg Empire. For the remainder of his career, Kahn devoted himself to sharing his vast knowledge of Austrian history as a teacher and scholar. By teaching, lecturing, and publishing on two continents, he served as a major force in establishing an ongoing dialogue between the scholarly communities of Austria and the United States, laying the groundwork for the cooperative programs and international symposia which we enjoy today. The University of Minnesota was fortunate to acquire Kahn's personal library after his death in 1981. It is a truly remarkable collection. Nearly 6,000 monograph volumes, significant periodicals, and 800 off-prints, emphasizing the political and intellectual histories of Austria and the Habsburg lands from the Renaissance to the 20th century. We are indeed very proud to have it here at the University of Minnesota, where it serves as a terrific resource for the C for CLA Center for Austrian Studies. And I want to say that the Center for Austrian Studies is itself remarkable in, uh, in its own right. I had the uh, uh, fortune earlier this uh, semester as I was introducing myself to uh, folks around campus to uh, meet with Gary and his team and learn more about the Center and the great work that they've been doing and, uh, and that they continue, uh, continue to do. The center explains this much more uh, eloquently and at greater length than I will but in, on its website, but in my mind, what the center does can be uh, thought of as making connections. That may take the form of nurturing an international community around a common interest, reaching across disciplines in the pursuit of new scholarship, creating classroom opportunities for students, for reaching out to the local community to raise awareness, all of these are about connections and about community, something that I value uh, and that the college <coughs> values very deeply. The center's founding director, William E. Wright, once recalled, we engaged people and the community beyond the confines of academia. That tradition continues today for the center and for the college as a whole. In CLA, uh, I spoke at length about this uh, recently in an address to the college. We study, we study communities, we build communities, and we serve communities. We connect the academic and the non-academic by building a strong culture of engagement with our state and with the world. Seeking out, creating, and nurturing these connections is indeed the business of a great uh, land-grant university and a great land-grant research institution, and the center has been pivotal 
in helping us uh, continue that uh, tradition and fulfilling that mission. So again, on behalf of the College of Liberal Arts, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for being here. I am pleased now to turn things back to uh, Gary, and he has some additional introductions for you. Thank you very much. Uh, we didn't know until about 10 days ago that Marilyn Con McElroy would be able to be with us this year. Uh, I didn't actually meet Marilyn and her brother uh, until I think about 2002, 2003, when I visited uh, their late mother and them in Princeton, uh, where Marilyn and her brother grew up. Uh, her father had been at the Institute for Indian Studies, John uh, mentioned, uh, and remained resident of the Blue and uh, remained resident in Princeton after uh, got the appointment at Rutgers. And it was my privilege and good fortune uh, to have Robert Kahn as the outside member of my dissertation committee. And I would go see Professor Kahn uh, in the family home. I remember uh, the books, which most of which, not all, but most of which are here in the Anderson Library. And Tim Johnson's back there. Glad to uh, make those available to you. Uh, the books were all over the house except in the kitchen and the bathroom. Uh, but in the kitchen were still the chairs and the breakfast table, uh, painted, and carefully hand painted for Mady and, and Peter. Uh, and uh, I still remember vividly that house and my visits uh, with Mady's uh, father and grandmother. I saw them again in Vienna after they moved there when he had retired from Rutgers. You would like to offer a couple thoughts for us? I, um, I just wanted to say I'm so happy to be here again after far too long. I, I was here for the inaugural lecture and my family was with me then. My firstborn son who was seven weeks old and Barbara Krauss Christensen kindly kept her from screaming through the lecture. <laughs> uh, we, um, we're so grateful, my family and I, that uh, that your the center is taking such wonderful care of the books. I got felt this far from them today. Maybe I'm hoping to actually smell them and touch them <laughs> late tomorrow, maybe, um, because I grew up with them. And uh, um, I want to particularly thank the former directors and Gary, who's now come back again, and David Good. Um, for just doing such a wonderful job with the center. We're, we're, my brother and I are, and husband are, are so impressed how it's grown and um, it's really very impressive. Um, what else did I want to say? Um, yes, my, my brother's going to be having lunch. Peter is going to be having lunch next week in Princeton with Howard Luthon and uh, Looking forward to that, and I hope I meet him someday. And uh, just that my father, um, he was a, a wonderful scholar and also a wonderful person and a wonderful uh, father. And notwithstanding his modesty, um, extreme modesty, he would be very happy to have this ongoing memorial to him. So I, I want to add one silly thing at the end. Um, my husband, Neil McElroy, is an opera fan. And when he, he, he's totally in love with the opera star Anna Netrepko, the soprano. <laughs> so she has a residence in Vienna, so she might count as an Austrian. So he's suggesting her as a speaker. <laughs> Jim Tracy had never given the Khan lecture. 
Uh, he has written on the history of uh, Europe uh, extensively in the 16th, uh, primarily the 16th century into the 17th century. Uh, the relationship of the Netherlands to the Habsburg realms. A very fine book on uh, Emperor Charles V's uh, military and war strategies and the economics of the wars. And lately, uh, he's been delving rather deeper into the history of peoples, government, borders, uh, and the relations of Habsburg Europe to Ottoman Southeastern Europe. Uh, and we'll hear about that in today's uh, lecture. Jim Tracy, surely one of the most distinguished scholars uh, who has been a member of our history department uh, over the last 40 or 50 years. He was educated at St. Louis University, took masters at Johns Hopkins in history of ideas and at Notre Dame in history of theology uh, before completing a PhD in history at Princeton University. Before he finished, uh, before he actually finished the dissertation, he began teaching in 1966-67 at the University of Minnesota. <clears throat> and he's an example of a man who saw, found his calling, both his field, his colleagues, his institution, stayed loyal to it over more than four decades. Mind you, there were some guest professorships uh, in the Netherlands and in France, I believe. A Guggenheim Fellowship, several Fulbright Fellowships for research in the Netherlands and in Belgium. But he remained very much uh, a major contributor to the intellectual life of our department, of the college, uh, and the campus. He's the author of some eight sole authored books, three on Erasmus of Rotterdam, uh, several important studies on the Habsburg Netherlands, uh, both the finances, the politics, uh, the warfare, the empires. As I mentioned, a book on Charles V, Impresario of War, Campaign Strategies, International Finance, uh, and a major book in 2008 on the founding of the Dutch Republic, War, Finance, and Politics uh, in Holland, 1572. 1588. If I go much longer on this, Jim will start to get very impatient with me, but there's many edited volumes and many, many journal articles and book chapters, uh, but amidst, amidst all, and uh, quite a list of PhD students completed, amidst all of that, he was also an excellent departmental college and university citizen. He served a term as chair of the department. Uh, he was an interim associate dean of the College of Liberal Arts. He was chair of the Council of Chairs in the College of Liberal Arts, president of the CLA Assembly, member of several major university committees, uh, someone who's paid his dues in all areas of the professorial life over many, many years. Today he speaks to us uh, with the title, The Habsburg Ottoman Wars, 1526 to 1606, A Clash of Civilizations. And I'm waiting to see if there's resonances of Samuel Huntington in the lecture beyond just the title. We'll find out. Jim, welcome. Now, I think I need to put this on before I start. something useful with it. Uh, can everybody hear? Uh, okay, first of all, I want to thank Gary for the invitation. I am honored uh, to stand here in succession to the really distinguished people who've been here before, starting with Carl Shorsky, as we just heard. And as someone who occasionally uses those obscure volumes, otherwise obscure in the Kahn collection, I'd also like to add my word of thanks to the generosity of the Kahn family that really has made this a very special place uh, for this kind of work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start right in with wars and treaties. Um, and I have tried to keep to a minimum the number of terms that are possibly unfamiliar, but as you know, old habits die hard, and I have not been able to eliminate them, so I have tried to put most of them on this glossary in which terms occur more or less, although there are a few problems in the order in which they appear. So I begin. Uh, wait a minute. I need to have a map. Wait a minute. What happened? There it is. 
Is it coming? Is it coming? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. All right. We're going to need that map uh, in, in just a moment, not right at this second. In 1526, Sultan Suleiman the Lawgiver invaded Hungary. Uh, King Louis II lost his army and soon died. Thereafter, the Kingdom of Hungary was claimed by Sultan Suleiman, by Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, uh, and by Janos Chapolyai, the Voivode of Transylvania. Apart from the long Turkish War of 1593 to 1606, major invasions from either side were infrequent. Also, the Habsburg monarchy and the Ottoman Empire made several multi-year peace agreements, starting with the Treaty of Edirne in 1547. And when a treaty elapsed, uh, truces were declared in the interim. Yet, the 1547 treaty reflected the priorities of distant capitals. Emperor Charles V needed calm in Hungary uh, in order to pursue his plans against the Protestant princes of Germany in the Schmalkaldic League. Sultan Suleiman needed quiet in the west so as to march east against the Ottoman Empire's main enemy, Shiite Iran. Uh, neither Charles nor Suleiman required more than a semblance of peace in Hungary. So, Ferdinand and his adversary, the Pasha or Governor General of Buda, were left to deal with border garrisons eager for booty and angry subjects demanding retaliation. In other words, the counterpart of imperial peace was Kleinkrieg, or warfare along the border in Hungary and Croatia. The raids uh, that resulted in permanent gains came mainly from the Ottoman side. Now, I have two maps that I'm going to show you, and I'm starting with this one, which shows the Kingdom of Hungary in 1480. You'll notice that the Kingdom of Hungary, this great gray splotch, is much bigger than modern Hungary. That's because it included not just modern Hungary, but also uh, modern Slovakia, modern Croatia, uh, a large chunk of modern Serbia, and a large chunk of modern Romania, known as Transylvania. All of these were pieces of the Kingdom of Hungary. And I want to call your attention to some areas uh, adjacent to that yellow blotch, which marks the Venetian Republic. Everybody see the yellow blotch? Okay. Uh, to the um, north, of the yellow blot, you can see three Austrian duchies that I will refer to. That is the duchies of Styria, Carinthia, and Carniola. And on, other so on the other side of the black line that on this map marks the boundary between Habsburg, Austria, and the Kingdom of Hungary, you will see the two parts of Croatia, namely Slavonia in the north and Croatia proper in the south. And on the other side of Croatia, you will see Bosnia, which is already uh, at the time of this map, an Ottoman province. Now, uh, the uh, next map, and if I can get to the next map, give me a second here. I was shown how to do this, but that doesn't mean that I can actually do it. Hang on, we're coming. How about that? Okay. <laughs> now, notice that most of that gray splotch has become yellow in one form or another. Uh, and uh, what's now gray is the part of Hungary that remains under the rule of the Habsburg dynasty. So it's just a small portion of that vast territory uh, that the Habsburgs managed to hold on to uh, by 1570. So the difference in these two maps, and I'm just going to leave this second map up, show the advances made by Ottoman forces in the half century after 1526. While many fortresses were captured in campaigns that fall under the rubric of Kleinkrieg, uh, the main acquisitions resulted from seven Ottoman invasions of Hungary, four of, four of which were led by Sultan Suleiman. By contrast, none of the various attacks that Ferdinand launched achieved a lasting conquest. Under Emperor Rudolf II, starting in 1576, uh, and his nephews, the Habsburgs managed to harden their defensive frontier against the Ottomans. Uh, a few decades later, the treaty that ended the long Turkish war confirmed a stalemate with boundaries rather similar to the map that you see here. Uh, then, in the 17th century, following decades of peace, the Ottoman siege of Vienna touched off a second phase uh, in the struggle, and by a treaty of 1719, the Habsburgs had recovered Hungary and most of Croatia. Now, not surprisingly, Habsburg historians have paid more attention to the glorious second phase of the struggle uh, than uh, to the first. 
For example, there is no history of the long Turkish war. Uh, for the two Turkish sieges of Vienna in 1529 and 1683, WorldCat has 113 entries uh, for the first and 1,099 for the second. Uh, so my presentation will be a small step uh, toward uh, redressing uh, that balance. I will focus on the period between 1526 and 1593, concentrating on what seem to be the main issues. How does one account for Ottoman success and Habsburg failure over a period of about 50 years? And how uh, were the Habsburgs finally able to solidify their mil military frontier? My contention is that these questions lead us to fundamental differences in political organization. Ottoman successes were due in no small part to unity of command emanating from the Sultan and his high officials. Conversely, disunity of command contributed uh, to Habsburg failure. Ferdinand's generals took orders not just from him, but also from the various provincial estates uh, or from the Diet of the Holy Roman Empire. In the end, however, Habsburg rulers learned how to exploit more effectively the cumbersome procedures of consultation which tied the Habsburg monarchy together. Now, a contrast framed in these terms has wider application. Uh, consultation between a ruler and his estates was common in early modern Europe. Uh, and in the contemporary Islamic world, the three so-called gunpowder empires, that is, uh, the Ottomans, uh, the Safavids of Iran, and the Mughals of India, uh, were all ruled uh, by all-powerful sovereigns uh, uh, ruling by decree. Uh, do I mean to suggest, then, uh, that the Habsburg-Ottoman conflict was, among other things, a clash of civilizations? I do. Uh, but, as Gary just alluded to, given the present state of discussion, I can hardly do so without uh, addressing, at least briefly, some criticisms of the whole idea of a clash of civilization. So my presentation will have two parts. I will first argue that the rhythm of military events, initial Ottoman success and then partial Habsburg success, uh, can be explained, cannot be explained without reference to two very different styles of government. Second, I will uh, try as best I can to defend my suggestion that this part was indeed, uh, this conflict was indeed in part a clash of civilizations. So, first of all, the Habsburg-Ottoman conflict, and I'm going to start with the Ottoman advantage. On a field of battle, superior resources do not necessarily entail victory, but careful preparation for war does have a bearing on the outcome. In this case, Ottoman conquests in Hungary reflected clear advantage, uh, clear advantages most obviously uh, in numbers of troops. In 1526, Hungary's king led some 25,000 men against an Ottoman force conservatively estimated at 80,000. Uh, later, in the Habsburg system of border defense, Austrian and Bohemian provinces paid the expenses for the nearest frontier sector. For example, the so-called inner Austrian duchies, that is, Styria, Carinthia, and Carniola, took responsibility for the two frontier sectors in Croatia, Slavonia, uh, and Croatia proper. In the 1540s, Ferdinand's spokesman informed the Hungarian Diet that the Bohemian lands paid for 10,000 men on the frontier, and the Austrian lands paid for 5,000. Uh, Ferdinand himself uh, paid for a fleet of gunboats based uh, on the Danube. By contrast, at this time, Sultan Suleiman had approximately uh, had a, st a standing army of approximately 90,000, including janissaries, uh, paid four times a year from the state treasury, uh, and cavalry called spahis who enjoyed the income of local uh, grants of land and taxes. As of 1576, uh, the Austrian troops, uh, the Austrian duchies had about 4,000 men on the frontier, or if you add those in the rear, about 6,000. Uh, the Ottomans had about 10,000. In 1578, uh, when the various Ottoman uh, governors uh, joined with the governor of Bosnia for an invasion of Croatia, they had an army reported at 24,000 men, uh, this was uh, a force that the Habsburgs could not match without months of preparation. Now, excuse me a moment. Large armies require uh, superior logistics. As of 1500, the Ottoman state had a commissariat and a network of supply depots, institutions that the Habsburg lands began to develop only after about 1550. 
To my knowledge, only one Habsburg Austrian army of this period marched as far as 300 miles to reach its objective. By contrast, uh, the Ottomans could and did send armies of over 100,000 as far as Vienna, which was 950 miles from Istanbul, or to the east to Tabriz in Iran, which was about uh, 1,150 miles uh, from the capital. Uh, the Ottomans, or excuse me, the Habsburgs, uh, expected their suppliers uh, to extend credit, but the Ottomans paid cash. Uh, and the combination of ready money uh, and an effective system of communication allowed the Ottomans to mount elaborate operations. In 1595, for example, for an invasion of Wallachia on the lower Danube, uh, the Grand Vizier at the time had grain brought from Cairo, so across the Mediterranean, across the Black Sea, and up the Danube, and so forth, to a point south of Bucharest where 500 boats waited to be transformed into pontoon bridges across the Danube. So this is the kind of thing that the Ottomans did fairly routinely. This was beyond the capacity uh, of, uh, of the Habsburgs. These differences reflect huge disparities in population and state income. In 1500, the Austrian and Bohemian lands had a combined population of about three and a half million. Uh, for a little bit later period, uh, the population of the Ottoman Empire has been estimated at 12 million. In 1560, Ferdinand's lands yielded the income of 1.7 million uh, Venetian ducats in income. Uh, and uh, at various points during his reign, the income of the Ottoman Empire uh, has been calculated at about 10 million Venetian ducats if you count these local revenues, or 4 million if you leave those local uh, revenues out. Uh, uh, while Ottoman, uh, excuse me, European monarchs were always in debt, uh, the Sultan's treasury could dispense huge sums. For example, in 1574, at the enthronement of a new Sultan, uh, the equivalent of 1.1 million gold ducats uh, was distributed as gifts to soldiers and officials. This was a sum equivalent to about half the annual income of the Venetian state. Uh, so this was this was just one occasion. Uh, when Ottoman armies went to war, uh, they were followed by chests of silver coin uh, for the purpose of making sure that the Janissaries and other salaried troops got their wages four times a year because they could cause trouble if they didn't. Uh, so, again, a very striking difference. <clears throat> However, an expanding state needed more than large forces and vast resources. To a degree that is striking for this period, Ottoman armies were guided by strategic planning. The conquest of a new province uh, involved two phases. The target area was first uh, devastated by raiders called Akinci, uh, whose attacks were meant to spread terror and to depopulate the enemy's countryside, and they were pretty effective at that. Uh, in the next phase, uh, an army would come and dispose of, usually rather quickly, uh, the forces of a now weakened adversary, and at the same time, the Akinci would be conducting their raids uh, uh, one or two provinces ahead, one or two areas ahead. Uh, it seems as well uh, that uh, there was a system of contingency planning for specific theaters of conflict. Uh, after an interval of peace uh, uh, dictated by imperial priorities, uh, commanders on particular fronts would invariably pick up where their predecessors had left off. For example, uh, along the fr frontier between uh, Bosnia and Croatia, it's pretty clear uh, from the uh, military campaigns of successive governors of Bosnia that the Ottomans followed uh, a series of priorities in, in terms of their strategic importance. Uh, the first target was Slavonia, which is the fertile plain between the River Sava and the River Drava. Uh, this was where the governor of Bosnia directed his attention in the 1530s. Then, in the 1540s, uh, his predecessor reportedly had orders to conquer Slavonia, quote, up to the borders of Germany, that is, Austria. Well, by the early 1550s, the Habsburgs had managed to erect something like a stable frontier in this area. And so the governor of Bosnia at that time turned to the south because the next target was the River Una, uh, which at that time blocked Ottoman access into Croatia because of a series of fortress towns along the Una. Uh, this region was conquered over the next 15 years. And then in, in the 1570s, uh, the current Bo uh, governor of Bosnia starts using new Ottoman bases west of the Una River to attack 
toward what is now the last uh, highly populated district in Croatia proper. Uh, and in fact, there was a governor of Bosnia who met his death in 1593 uh, pursuing the same objective. Uh, thank you. That actually helps a little bit. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm, I hate to be in the dark on my own words. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, just, just, it'll come up. All right, there it is. Well, all right, well, that helps too. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm just not used to the fact that I have to kind of keep, uh, keep touching things here. Uh, um, so, uh, that's, that's an example of what I mean in terms of planning at the local level as well as this system of, of uh, uh, conquering provinces in stages. Now, I don't mean to suggest that Ottoman government was despotic. It was not. Uh, in the, is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. It's actually better for me if this is tolerable. Uh, in the high councils of state, it was recognized that even the sultan ought to be guided by objective rules of established law. Yet the law itself recognized the absolute independence of supreme authority. In almost all corners of the empire, local interests had no institutional basis for resisting orders from the capital. Towns did not have elected magistrates. Provinces had representation only insofar uh, as the governor of a province had a secretary at the capital. The capital is usually called the port, the sublime port. So provinces had rep representation only insofar as the governor had a secretary at the port who looked after his interests. Now, military affairs were handled by the governors general and the governors who served under them uh, who commanded uh, regional forces. Uh, from about 1590, following a financial reorganization in the empire, a governor general might be able to defy uh, the port. Yet the sultan and his viziers, his primary advisors, did not make requests of these leading provincial officials. They issued orders. Ottoman historians, I think more often than not, conclude that this top-down chain of command worked in practice and not just in theory. Uh, the consistent strategy that Ottoman commanders followed will thus have reflected the unquestioned authority of orders from the center. In sum, uh, rule by decree was the keystone in the arch of Ottoman military success. Now, I'm going to pause for a minute here before proceeding to Habsburg weakness. Uh, the Habsburg monarchy had strategic interests in a buffer zone uh, in Hungary and Croatia against Ottoman expansion. But Emperor Charles V, the head of the family, did not see the dynasty as having real interests in this remote region. As Ferdinand laid claim to Hungary, Charles wrote from Spain, urging him to avoid war and make the best peace he could. Ferdinand defended his willingness to challenge the Sultan. In one letter, he says he prefers an honorable death to a shameful peace. Another letter ev evokes his duty as a Christian prince, quote, never will I give so many men and women, boys and girls, images of God into the hands of the Turks. These letters bring us, I think, as close as we are likely to get to the reasons why, despite all obstacles, Ferdinand maintained his claim to Hungary with what one scholar has called unbelievable tenacity. Now, Ferdinand's treasurer remarked at one point that even the fist of a potent king would not suffice to, to resist the sultan, and Ferdinand himself did not have a potent fist. He had subsidy grants uh, from his Austrian and Bohemian provinces, but the estates not only approved these taxes, they also collected the money and set limits to its use. Uh, Styria, for example, was slow to accept, accept the idea of actually stationing troops beyond its border. Uh, when the Styrians finally agreed to do so, their preferred idea was to put the men on the border between Styria, uh, Syria uh, and Croatia, and not on the more distant border between Croatia and Ottoman uh, Bosnia. Uh, for, uh, moreover, without money, the ruler of a, of a uh, the would-be ruler of a new realm uh, was not able to make friends among the great men. Uh, in uh, 1527, in Slavonia, uh, Ferdinand's men went uh, to talk to the local estates, but they found that Ferdinand's rival, the voivode of Transylvania, had already given away the choice land, so there was not much to be done. They next went to Croatia where the estates demanded, in turn, for their willingness to elect as Ferdinand, uh, Ferdinand as king, uh, a promise to support a thousand light cavalry. Uh, and so Ferdinand's representatives made on his behalf a promise they knew he could not keep. 
Uh, in practice, Ferdinand defended his frontiers by engaging the self-interest of the great men. If a vital fortress town is cheated to the crown, he would transfer it to a loyal magnate, uh, often in part payment for loans to the crown by the same gentleman. Uh, yet, the interests of the great men, of course, were not always consistent with Fer Ferdinand's. Uh, the Bishop of Zagreb, for example, was a leading partisan of his rival, uh, the Voivode of Transylvania. At one point, Ferdinand contemplated an attack on the bishop's uh, stronghold, but his military commander advised against it. Quote, it would cost your, money, uh, cost your majesty a great deal uh, to conquer the bishop's lands, only to have to give them out again to another magnate. Uh, so Ferdinand was, in effect, dependent on these people who were kind of mini kings, if you will, in their own uh, right. Hungary was also a separate kingdom whose laws Ferdinand had to respect if he wished to retain the loyalty of the aristocracy. As a result, even minor questions might go down an Austrian chain of command, uh, up a Hungarian chain of command, and back down again. Uh, for example, an Austrian commander in Croatia sent uh, reinforcements to the fortress of Bihać. But they were denied entrance. Uh, the captain would not admit them without an order from his superior, who in turn awaited instructions from the Council of Hungary. Uh, and this was a not untypical uh, example. Finally, uh, these complications of a composite monarchy were spiced uh, by national prejudices. Hungarians were not fond of Germans, that is Austrians, and the Austrians in turn regarded the Hungarians as unstable, and they harbored deep suspicions about the Croatian nobles who were known in the past to have bargained with the Ottomans uh, in the hopes of sparing their family lands. In 1537, these problems combined to produce a disaster. Hans Katzianer, a leading Habsburg commander, uh, proposed to roll back Ottoman gains in Slavonia by conquering uh, the fortress of Osijek. He mortgaged his own property to hire Swiss infantry, and the Habsburg lands raised a large force of infantry and cavalry. But in Katzianer's telling of the story, the commanders disagreed right from the start. For example, uh, the Bohemian commander insisted on following his own route. He didn't want to go the same way that everybody else did. When they finally got to Osiak, the commander saw uh, that because of the town's gun emplacements, they could not possibly attack from the west. So the Hungarians suggested a quick march around the town to attack from the east. When Katzianer and some of the uh, others uh, expressed reservations, because this would mean leaving the supply train behind, uh, the Hungarians accused the Germans of running off and leaving them in the lurch. And so, as you might imagine, the plan was adopted. Uh, but uh, what happened was that as the men advanced, uh, the Ottoman units blocked their route and pushed them towards swampy ground, uh, leaving retreat as the only option. So even before the signal was given, this once mighty army melted into the darkness, uh, leaving its artillery behind. Now, the Habsburg monarchy could not hope to match the Ottoman Empire uh, without the full support of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, counting Bohemia and not the Austrian lands, the empire had about 14 million people uh, in 1550. It also had a system of taxation uh, levied on 383 separate units, free cities and princely territories, originally for the purpose of providing an army to the emperor-elect, that is Charles V, uh, if he should decide to go to Rome for his coronation by the Pope. Uh, but this uh, tax was put in place by the Diet of Worms, which, as you, some of you may recall, was the same diet that also put one Martin Luther beyond the protection of the law. So, as religious tensions in the empire grew, the Protestant estates became leery about voting funds uh, for an army. If the Catholic Habsburgs were given an army, what would they do with it? Uh, and so, uh, although the Diet uh, did, in 1529, send troops to help defend Vienna against the Ottomans, in 1530 they voted another so-called Turk tax, but this was to be collected only in case of need. And two years later, when the Ottomans were marching through Hungary, this money was not released until two emissaries from the Diet had actually traveled to Hungary and seen with their own eyes that the Ottoman troops were in fact marching toward uh, Vienna. Uh, so this was basically the situation in the Diet. Consequently, Ferdinand, as uh, King of the Romans, or heir apparent to the imperial throne, did not even bother summoning another Diet until 1542. Now what changed was that the Ottomans in 1541 made the city of Buda 
an Ottoman uh, bulwark, an Ottoman province. Uh, so in 1542, the Imperial Diet raised a splendid army, uh, which was sent off to siege the city of Pest on the other side of the river, and they actually occupied it for a few months, uh, but then they soon withdraw. There had been reportedly an outbreak of fever, but Ferdinand's border commander indicated another reason uh, in his, I hope I presume that stuff goes away, uh, indicated another reason in his, uh, in a private letter to Charles V. The army at Pest was short of supplies. Poor logistics was probably the best explanation for the failure of Habsburg armies to match their adversaries in siege warfare. Ottoman attacks against Habsburg fortresses were often successful, but it was rare for an Ottoman fortress to succumb to attack. The next year, the Ottomans made further gains in Hungary. The Diet voted for troops, but uh, this time the men refused to cross into Hungary, which was beyond the borders of the empire. Uh, in a desperate situation, Ferdinand convened a Diet in Hungary. Apparently, his representative promised that Charles V himself would come in person with an army the following spring. Now, this was a desperate ploy because Ferdinand surely knew that Charles V was in, plan in fact planning to invade France the following spring. So, so he was going west, uh, not east. Now, later in that next year, 1544, uh, Ferdinand asked Charles to send an emissary to the next diet. So Charles sent a Flemish diplomat named Gerard Feltwein, who's kind of an interesting character in his own right. And when he arrived, uh, Ferdinand pleaded with him not to let it slip that Charles was in fact not coming to Hungary. Uh, Feltwein's instructions from Charles were, proceed, were to proceed to the Ottoman capital, which he did, and there he negotiated on Ferdinand's behalf uh, the 1547 uh, Treaty of Edirne. Meanwhile, in Germany, Charles achieved a military success, or he thought he did, because he defeated the armies of the Schmalkaldic League, and the ensuing Diet of Augsburg obligingly voted a Turk tax. However, Charles' attempt to settle Germany's religious divisions by force also meant that Ferdinand could not expect much help from the Protestant estates uh, for his war in Hungary. Uh, meanwhile, Ferdinand now learned something of Ottoman diplomacy. The 1547 treaty obliged him uh, to pay the Sultan 30,000 Hungarian florins a year. Uh, Habsburg Protocol insisted that this was a voluntary gift, but everybody understood that it was a tribute. It was also uh, a proper recognition of Ferdinand's real military weakness. For the remainder of his reign, until he died in 1564, his ambassadors at the Sublime Port were instructed uh, to represent their sovereign uh, as a dutiful son, entirely dependent on the benevolent goodwill of, quote, his gracious father, uh, Sultan Suleiman. <laughs> so, uh, the next phase, hardening of the frontier. How do we get from that to, to something a little different? Uh, in April 1552, Ferdinand seized the initiative in imperial politics. He met privately with Elector Moritz, the Lutheran ruler of Saxony, an erstwhile Habsburg ally who had now rebelled against Charles V. The two princes agreed that Lutheran and Catholic princes should henceforth have the same rights in imperial law. Uh, and this was quite new because hitherto the Lutherans had no rights in imperial law. That is, henceforth, Lutheran and Catholic princes should have the right to determine the religion of their territory. So Lutherans and Catholics are put on the same basis. Uh, Charles V firmly opposed his brother's concession to heresy. But after a disastrous campaign at Metz at the end of 1552, uh, Charles was a broken man. And so a, a few years later, under the 1555 Peace of Augsburg, uh, the compact between Ferdinand and the Elector Moritz was enshrined in imperial law. Uh, in 1556, as Charles was preparing to abdicate, Ferdinand got him to delay announcing his decision in Germany so that the electoral princes would have time to devise procedures for an abdication. There had never been one before. And this, I think, is an example of the kind of respect that Ferdinand shows for the consultative traditions of the empire, which I think also helps to explain why uh, the Turk taxes began to get a little bit larger uh, at, at about this time. Meanwhile, uh, Habsburg raiders uh, especially from a fortress in southwestern Hungary called Sigetfar, were attacking Ottoman shipping along the Danube. Uh, early in 1557, word came from the Ottoman court 
that Ferdinand would be granted a renewal of the 1547 peace treaty, uh, but only if the fortress of Sigethar were, quote, raised to the ground. Now, a new treaty uh, would not stop war along the border because the old treaty hadn't stopped it either. However, a peace treaty did afford some hope that during the time of the treaty, the Sultan would not invade in force. On the other hand, attacking Ottoman shipping on the Danube was a way of preventing uh, Buda from being built up uh, as a base for an attack uh, in, into Austria. So Ferdinand was faced with a momentous decision, and in his usual way, instead of deciding, he decided to seek advice. Uh, he first asked the Hungarian Diet. Uh, then he asked the various provincial uh, estates of the Austrian and Bohemian lands. And finally, he asked the Diet of the Holy Roman Empire. In each case, uh, the body in question would get copies of the relevant diplomatic correspondence, and they would also get copies of all of the opinions previously uh, handed in. Now, uh, in acting as he did, Ferdinand acted in the way that was most likely to rally the greatest possible consensus behind his ultimate decision. The Habsburg monarchy, a composite polity made up of composite polities, was held together as much by the process of consultation as by the sovereign. Uh, also, Many of those consulted had uh, military experience, and they understand the importance of the fortress of Sigethor and its raiders, as I just described. So after 18 months, Ferdinand had a reply to the Sultan's demand. His answer was no. However, uh, this decision proved to be a misreading of the balance of forces. Sooner or later, the Ottomans would have to react to a threat to their lines of supply and communication. And so in 1566, one Ottoman army captured the fortress of Sigethar, while another captured a good portion of eastern Hungary. Meanwhile, the 80,000-man army assemb assembled by uh, Ferdinand's successor, Emperor Maximilian II, broke up without doing anything. Uh, and so, after this humiliating defeat, Maximilian apparently decided to avoid all further provocation. Meanwhile, even though the Ottomans were, from 1578, engaged in a series of difficult campaigns against Iran, they still kept up the pressure in Hungary and Croatia. And after a favorable peace with Iran in 1590, uh, the pressure in, uh, intensified. Bosnia's governor uh, in 1591 attacked into Croatia with such force uh, that some historians prefer to date the long Turkish war from 1591 instead of 1593. Now, in the meantime, uh, Rudolf II had succeeded as emperor and also as king in Hungary, Hungary and Bohemia. This was in 1576. Uh, while his three uncles ruled in Lower Austria, Tyrol, and Inner Austria. In 1577, Rudolf authorized what was called a high consultation, uh, a Hauptberatschlagung, uh, dedicated to the border. Uh, and so, as a result, uh, provincial deputies uh, and military experts met for two months in Vienna in the fall. Their recommendations uh, fill about 750 folio pages. Uh, details were then modified by local assemblies, as in a local meeting of the Inner Austrian Estates in 1578. Uh, the end result was a master plan for defending 130 strongholds on the frontier with anchor fortresses and supply depots to the rear. For each position, it was specified how many soldiers of different types were needed and which province would pay the bill. On the Slavonian and uh, Croatian frontiers, according to these plans, the complement of troops was to increase by about 40%, and the taxes needed to pay for them uh, were to increase by about 60%. Now, in the meantime, in return for their agreement to these higher taxes, the estates, which are mainly Lutheran, uh, demand and get recognition of freedom of worship for Lutherans in the towns and not just as was currently the practice on the estates of the nobles. Uh, at the same time, Turk taxes voted by the imperial diet uh, increased, well, I won't give you the numbers, I'm probably doing too many numbers, but, but by a significant amount. Uh, so all of this looks good, but of course implementation is a different matter. The estates were slow as ever in collecting the taxes that they had approved. At a distant outpost like the town of Senja, the Croatian town of Senja on the Adriatic coast, uh, garrison wages were hardly ever paid, and certainly not on time. And so as a result, as before, uh, the garrison of this town, called Uskoks, 
were left to support themselves by raiding Ottoman targets. And sometimes Venetian targets were good measure, but that's another, uh, that's another matter. Uh, on the Slavonian frontier, opposite Styria, uh, the fortresses were better provided for, but that was only because the estates of Styria contracted loans uh, in order to make up for the shortfall uh, in tax receipts. Now, another issue was finding soldier colonists. The likeliest recruits uh, were Orthodox Vlachs, V-L-A-C-H-S. That's a whole separate story who these people were. Uh, but many of them were now serving as auxiliaries in Ottoman lands, but they were susceptible to a better offer. But in order to cross the border, they demanded not only freedom from taxes, but also freedom from feudal dues. This, of course, led to a clash with the aristocracy, which was not finally resolved until the year 1630, when Emperor Ferdinand II issued a decree which overruled uh, the opinion of the estates. Finally, the dynasty itself pursued conflicting objectives. Uh, although their military men were mostly Lutheran, or in some cases Calvinist, Habsburg rulers sought to reimpose Catholic worship on burghers and peasants, if not the nobles. In inner Austria, where Lutheran preachers stressed the duty of obedience to the ruler, this policy was harmful, if not fatal, to the war effort. Uh, in Transylvania, however, Rudolf II's decision to reimpose Catholic worship in the towns uh, provoked a successful Calvinist rebellion that led to the independence of Transylvania. Despite all these problems, uh, the military reforms of 1577 uh, and 78 marked a turning point. Habsburg troops were now more likely than their Ottoman foes to be equipped with firearms. This was, I won't go into detail, but this was a development started earlier, but it was confirmed uh, by these new decisions. Uh, although Ottoman incursions continued, they were often as not repelled with losses. By the treaty that ended the Long Turkish War uh, in 1606, the Ottoman Empire gained two key fortresses, but Rudolf II gained recognition as a sovereign equal in stature to the Sultan. After a one-time remittance, uh, the Habsburgs no longer paid tribute for their lands in Hungary. Uh, so in this case, too, a diplomatic protocol reflected the military situation. Now, the Habsburgs had an edge not just in firepower, but also in finance. Quotas for the annual subsidies of the inner Austrian duchies rose by about 30% over a period, 300% rather, over a period of 30 years. Uh, that seems like a lot, but if you assume that inflation was 2% a year, uh, that would amount to 180%. So you still get a net gain in income for the Habsburgs uh, uh, between those two. However, on the Ottoman side, there is not a net gain in income. Uh, uh, Linda Darling has calculated uh, Ottoman state income over a period of 100 years, and basically what she finds is that state income went, over, went up by a little more than 200%, and inflation went up by a little more than 200%. Now, it may seem surprising that the less autocratic government was able to tax its people more effectively, but in fact, the underlying principle was recognized for a long time. As Montesquieu said in his Spirit of the Laws, one can raise taxes higher in proportion to the liberty of the subjects. Uh, to carry that a step farther, make parenthesis, the most heavily taxed countries in early modern Europe were England and the Dutch Republic. Okay, the freest governments had the highest taxation. So, so close parentheses and come back. Uh, taxes were only half the story. No government could sustain a major war year after year without resorting to credit. The Ottoman state imposed forced loans. It also borrowed from the surplus funds of charitable foundations. Yet by comparison with Europe's public subscription loans, the scale of Ottoman borrowing was insignificant. In a pinch, the Sultan would authorize loans from his private treasury to the state treasury. Uh, it seems, for example, that during the long Turkish war, uh, Ottoman fighting was entirely financed in one year in, in this way. Uh, by contrast, Habsburg Austria, like all other European governments, was utterly dependent on private credit markets, especially in time of war. Uh, in sum, if government by decree made for a highly effective chain of command, government by consultation made for a flow of private credit to the public chest. From 1593 to 1606, uh, two megastates endowed with these differing advantages fought to a standstill. But one advantage was more easily replicated than the other. 
Over the course of the 17th century, the Habsburgs tightened their chain of command as the monarchy grew stronger and the estates declined. The Ottoman Empire did not have a European-style public debt until the 19th century. In the end, the Ottoman system was better at commanding from its subjects an obedience that always impressed European observers, probably impressed them a little bit too much. Uh, the Habsburg system, in turn, was better at mobilizing the wealth and resources of its subjects. So, now I come to a clash of civilization, but I have to pause here. Uh, Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations provoked a lively debate about our contemporary world, but you may be relieved to hear that I don't feel that a 16th century historian has a whole lot to contribute uh, to, that, to that particular discussion. My question is whether Huntington's ideas can be read on civilizational conflict can be read back into the past. He does make it easier to do so by using a definition that is behavioral rather than essentialist. A civilization is simply, quote, the broadest level of identification with which people strongly identify. Now, some or perhaps most of the conflicts that Huntington sees in the present are hard, if not impossible, to discern in the past. Yet, in my view, there was indeed, in the early modern centuries, a clash between the civilization of Islam and the civilization of Latin Christendom. The mountain of early modern broadsides, pamphlets, and sermons on the Turkish threat to Europe has produced in recent decades at least a small mound of scholarship. Uh, this threat was also of great concern uh, to the peasantry, at least in frontier areas. Uh, Hungary had two major peasant rebellions during the 16th century, and in both rebellions, one of many grievances was the failure of the nobles uh, to protect people from the Turks, which was indeed a legitimate grievance. Uh, to be sure, the medieval idea of the crusade had become a point of theological contention. Catholics still believed in the idea of the crusade, but Protestants followed Luther in rejecting the idea that any war could be holy. Nonetheless, Lutheran commanders of Habsburg armies saw it as a religious duty to defend their land from attack until God in his mercy called off the infidel scourge. In reform centers like Zurich and Geneva, theologians wondered whether an Ottoman victory might not be preferable to a triumph for Catholic idolaters. On the Hungarian frontier, however, Calvinist preachers urged believers to resist uh, the common enemy. For all of these reasons, the role of, the, of Ottoman pressure in shaping early modern Europe's sense of its own collective identity is something like a commonplace, as far as I can see, uh, in the current literature on European identity. To quote one scholar, the dominant other in the history of the European state system remains the Turk. Uh, according to another, it was apparently under the strain of the Ottoman onslaught starting in the 15th century that the term Europe began for the first time to be used frequently. Now there are uh, objections and plausible objections to this point of view. Uh, and I will mention three. I'm sure others can think of more. Uh, but I will mention three. First, uh, continuing Ottoman expansion. Was it a real threat? Or was it mainly the product of a fevered European imagination stoked by propagandists who may have had their own agendas? Secondly, even if the danger was real, how can one speak of Europe as forming a common front given that major and important European states formed military alliances with the Turks to fight other European states? Finally, if one is minded to argue for a cultural unity that sometimes uh, somehow transcended political differences, must it not be acknowledged that the religious foundations of medieval Europe's cultural unity were even now breaking apart? Uh, so first, the Ottoman threat. Uh, when Sultan Mehmed II conquered Constantinople in 1453, it seemed to Europeans the first step in a grand plan of conquest. Similar fears recurred with each subsequent Ottoman advance. Yet, Ottoman objectives are open, were open to debate in the 16th century, and they still are. Uh, it seems, uh, or at least it has been plausibly argued, I think, that the empire did have a grand strategy, at least by the time of Sultan Suleiman. But it has also been argued that Suleiman's campaigns in Hungary uh, were merely a reaction to Habsburg imperial overreach. Uh, Suleiman would have tolerated the voivode of Transylvania as king in Hungary, but not the brother of Charles V. The partisans of Janusz Trapoljai, the voivode, uh, 
uh, espouse this point of view, and so does the important strand of modern Hungarian historiography. In this reading of the conflict, Suleiman's first invasion of Hungary was prompted by an insult to his ambassador. If he occupied Buda in 1541, relegating Chapolyai's widow to Transylvania, it was only to counter a Habsburg invasion. Yet one reason that Sultan Suleiman turned west after his campaigns in Iran was to content his fighting men. They still believed that going to war ought to mean fighting against the infidel, even if Sunni religious leaders were saying more and more that fighting against heretic Shiites is just as important, if not more important. This is kind of, whoops, sort of um, uh, a, a point of view of the, of the religious scholars, but it doesn't seem to be shared very widely. Moreover, recently discovered Ottoman documents put Suleiman's Hungarian campaigns in a different light. Uh, a victory declaration issued after his capture of Belgrade in 1521 indicates that the march to Hungary was decided on shortly after his accession in 1520 and thus before uh, the insult to his ambassador in Buda. Uh, in other words, Suleiman, uh, it seems, planned from the outset to replicate in the West the great conquest made in the East by his father, his predecessor. Uh, in 1541, Suleiman carried with him a list of important fortresses in Hungary, most of them occupied by Ottoman troops as he marched toward Buda. To be sure, the vast Ottoman state, with its multiple strands of legitimation, had long since outgrown its origins as a federation of Islamic Ghazi warriors. And yet, uh, the ideal of the advance of Islam's frontier at the expense of the infidel remained a settled objective of state policy, even, uh, according to one scholar, uh, in the 17th century. Uh, campaigns in Hungary thus had a dual aspect. They were preceded by European provocations, but they also served a larger purpose. As for war propaganda, it never fails to overshoot the mark. Uh, there are many descriptions of Turkish atrocities, and they are rightly treated uh, gingerly by historians. There are many problems, but one problem is there is a lack of any comparable Ottoman documentation that would allow one to put accounts of Habsburg atrocities and Ottoman atrocities uh, side by side. We just don't have uh, that kind of information. Now, uh, in any case, propaganda aside, there is such a thing as rational fear. Consider what it meant for the Habsburgs when Buddha became an Ottoman bulwark. The governor general of Buddha had 5,000 men in his garrison, including 2,000 janissaries, and he had a fleet of gunboats. Fifteen governors reported to him, uh, each with his own military retinue. Buddha was also connected to Istanbul along the Danube corridor. In 1556, for example, 30,000 cannonballs were loaded onto five galleys and shipped across the Black Sea and up the Danube uh, as far as Buddha. Uh, before proceeding to Istanbul, Habsburg ambassadors now had to present themselves at the court of a pasha who comported himself like a king. Any government based in, in Vienna, 130 miles upstream from Buda, would have been foolish not to regard Buda as a potential springboard for Ottoman attack. Uh, now I come to reason of state. As Suleiman marched on Vienna in 1532, uh, Charles V commanded a war flotilla headed down the Danube from Regensburg. Yet the Sultan turned back before the Imperial Army reached Vienna, and there would be no further uh, occasion for a direct confrontation. The Sultan and the Emperor were indeed rivals, but each gave more attention to an enemy within his own cultural world. Iran in the case of Sultan, France in the case of Charles V. In Europe, propagandists for the Habsburgs and the Valois uh, each blamed the other side for uh, obstructing a union of Christian princes against the infidel. Meanwhile, across Europe, local contacts were drawn into the vortex of this great rivalry. Uh, Venice, uh, a French ally, uh, feared Habsburg hegemony in Italy and needed Ottoman goodwill to preserve its trade with the East. Poland, Lithuania, another ally, maintain peace with the port in order to focus on its main enemy, which was Muscovy. Uh, the Reformation only highlighted these political divisions. Uh, Protestant England courted favor uh, at the port by importing metal for making weapons, uh, a trade forbidden to Catholic merchants. Queen Elizabeth's ambassador represented his nation uh, as united with uh, Muslim Turks in denouncing Catholic idolatry. 
Now, to my knowledge, France was the only European power that ever conducted joint naval operations with the Ottomans. But since the late Byzantine era, Christian states, great and small, had made alliances with the Turks, and one might conclude that the idea of Christendom was little more than a propaganda tool uh, for governments at certain times. Uh, some scholars go a step further. In light of Turkish involvement in Europe's wars, the Ottoman Empire, they contend, was not the external enemy of Europe, but rather an integral part of the European state system. Now, this last contention, I think, is refuted in a recent essay by Arno Strohmeyer. Uh, he points out the incompatibility of Ottoman and European diplomatic protocol. European states had representation in Istanbul from uh, as early as the 1480s. The Sultan had no rep resident ambassador in Europe until 1793. Diplomatic immunity was unknown uh, at the Sublime Port. Uh, the practice of clapping an ambassador into prison when his prince displeased the Sultan uh, continued to the reign of a Sultan who came to the throne uh, in 1789. If European tr rulers made treaties with one another as among equals, the Sultan did not recognize even the Holy Roman Emperor as his peer. Uh, Strohmeyer thinks that treaties with France were an exception, but he cites the French text. Uh, one French ambassador found to his dismay in the 1580s that if you look at the Turkish text, what they actually say is that the French king is simply commanded to do what the Sultan wants him to do. Uh, this, is, this is basically the Ottoman style. Uh, so, uh, in 17th and 18th century diplomatic manuals, the Ottoman Empire is not counted among the powers of Europe. The real question, I think, is whether warring states may nonetheless constitute a civilization. And on this point, I agree with Huntington, quote, civilizations are cultural and not political entities. Uh, he mentions Japan as a rare example of a civilization that is also a state. In Europe, uh, the uh, in the Europe that emerged in the early Middle Ages, the ancient Roman dream of unity never took hold. Even in the time of, Cru of the Crusades, uh, states pursued their own uh, objective. Uh, early modern sources, I think, uh, indicate that people felt a sense of identity at multiple levels, the broadest and most diffuse of which was as Christians or Europeans. Even in France, the Sultan's closest ally, the government made no attempt to counteract popular anti-Turkish sentiment. Instead, the king's pamphleteers made the case that the Christian people would have suffered even more horribly had His Majesty's soldiers not uh, restrained the cruelty of their uh, Turkish allies. Uh, in, uh, uh, so, uh, that's basically what I want to say about that, uh, kind of moving on a little bit. Uh, finally, the unity of Western European civilization. Uh, even if most scholars no longer argue for a simplistic connection between secularism and modernity, it remains true that religious categories gradually became less important in shaping the ways people understood their world. Uh, one example of this is that Italian humanists pretty consistently presented the Ottomans in terms that were classical rather than Christian. Uh, the Turks were barbarians who threatened the civilized world, much as the Goths had threatened ancient Rome. Especially after the fall of Constantinople, Italian humanists drove home the theme of Ottoman barbarism, uh, quote, to the point of fetishism, as one scholar says. Uh, from around, uh, well, I'll skip that next point. Uh, in the dispatches of Venetian ambassadors uh, from around 1500, one finds a dark reading of the Ottoman body politic in which the obedience of subjects was thought to rest entirely on their fear of terrible and arbitrary punishment. So the idea of barbarism brought in its wake the idea of despotism. One diplomat who articulated what may be called a secular view of the Ottoman state uh, was a man called Buzbek, and I won't trouble you with his full name, let's just call him Buzbek. He was a Flemish humanist who served as Ferdinand's ambassador at the port uh, from 1554 to 1562. Uh, in all of his writings, as far as I know, Buzbek gives no hint of a personal religious preference. Uh, he describes Ottoman statecraft in terms he had learned from his study of Roman history, but at the same time he has no love for this barbarian race and begs to be relieved of the duty of living among them. Uh, what he meant by their barbarism is exemplified in a passage from one of his writings. As Buzbek traveled through Asia Minor, he collected ancient uh, coins. 
In one town, a coppersmith told him he had, a few days earlier, melted down a whole pile of these useless old coins from which he made two good pots. Uh, Uzbek got back at the man by saying how much gold he would have paid if those useless coins were still available. This contrast between two worlds has nothing to do with religion. On the one hand, civilized Europeans uh, are the proud heirs of ancient Greece and Rome, barbarous Turks are not. Let us say then that there was already in the 16th century an incipient chasm between secular and Christian ways of seeing the world. Uh, my argument is that a civilization is not an answer, it is more like a question. Who are we as opposed to them? Human ingenuity has likely supplied multiple answers to such questions in every age and for every civilization. In 16th century Europe, a rather idiosyncratic answer was provided by Buzbeck's contemporary Guillaume Postel, a humanist, a mystic, and a sometime Jesuit who had lived for two periods in Ottoman lands. He was also a Frenchman whose king was an ally of the Sultan. Uh, his book on the Ottomans concentrates on describing their virtues because, as he says, their vices have been more than sufficiently described by other writers. Um, he does not define the Turks as barbarians or infidels. Instead, he finds an alternate terminology. Uh, the Sultan's subjects are Levantines, that is, people of the East, uh, whereas the people of Postel's world are Ponentines, that is, peoples of the West. This was but one of the names for the world in which Postel lived, and probably not a very common one. Uh, my point is that all of these names mark Europe off from an alien and, for many people, deeply threatening Ottoman world. And uh, my suggestion is that this is the larger context uh, for the Habsburg-Ottoman conflict. Now, I want to conclude by raising a question I cannot answer. If we grant that a civilization's sense of identity uh, can be shaped by threat from without, were there also ways in which Ottoman pressure helped to bring about specific changes within Europe? And likewise, were there ways in which European pressure helped to bring about changes within the Ottoman Empire? The latter issue seems not to be discussed by Ottoman scholars except in reference to gunpowder technology. The possibility of Ottoman impact on Europe uh, has not drawn much attention either. For example, in regard to the military discipline, reform of military discipline starting from the late 16th century, uh, some authors like Buzbek argued uh, that the manifestly superior discipline of Ottoman troops uh, pointed to the need for fundamental changes in how European soldiers were trained. But the standard argument uh, is that the reform of military discipline came about from a closer study of uh, <coughs> Roman military manuals with little or no reference to the Ottomans. Last month at a conference I heard an encouraging note. Europe is often differentiated from other civilizations because it generated successive waves of profound cultural change, including the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment. These developments are commonly described as arising from within Europe's own history. For example, growing calls for a reform of the church, evident from the middle decades of the 15th century, are linked to such things as lay piety or schools of uh, scholastic theology or the dysfunctional habits of the clergy. But Professor Christopher Ocker has noticed that the calls for reform quoted are coincided with something else. And so I quote briefly from his paper. Looming large on the 15th century landscape was a clarifying beam of disruptive energy from the Eastern Mediterranean associated with Sultan Mehmed II, Mohammed Redivivus, proof positive that Christian repentance was about as necessary as the Crusades proved to be impossible. We ought to give more attention to the ways Muslim conflict affected religious identities, acknowledging the entanglement of Christian sensibilities in Europe with cultures across the Roman lake. Now, this is merely a suggestion, but I find it a very interesting suggestion. Uh, it opens the door, uh, possibly, for a way of seeing European history and Ottoman history as two parts of a larger story. But that door remains open only if we recognize that the two worlds came together in opposition, a conflict of worlds or a clash of civilizations. So I thank you for your patience.
Well, if anybody's still awake, that's right. <laughs> yes, Kim? Well, this comes from the 20th century, but I wonder if you couldn't borrow another uh, couple of concepts. One uh, is the idea of total war, because it seems to me that what you just described is that the Ottoman Empire reached the limits of its resources and the ab ability to fight a total war, mm -hmm. uh, which went on for a very long time. And the other one, uh, it seems to me, would be the concept of limits as to empires. And it seemed to me also in that regard, the Ottoman Empire reached um, uh, an extreme limit. I mean, if you go all the way from Iran or Persia, do we call it? Yes, yes. All the way to um, oh, yes. Oh, yes. the borders of um, uh, the uh, Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. That's, that's far too large to maintain, unless you have enormous resources, which you made clear they don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a very, let me ask you, answer your question this way. Uh, first of all, when I get past 1600, I get a little bit shaky. So, when I get back to 1600. All right. All right. All right. But, but this is kind of the impression that I have from, from Ottoman scholarship. There is an ongoing debate as to whether there was an inherent limit in how far the Ottoman Empire could go. And some scholars have suggested that Buddha, for example, represents this limit. On the other hand, other scholars will say, well, that's not exactly true because if you look to the Persian frontier, which is more important to the Ottomans, if you count up the years the Sultan was on campaign, they were in Persia more than they were fighting in, in, in Hungary, and that's actually farther. Uh, so just in terms of the physical possibilities, yeah. it, it isn't there. Now, in terms of financial possibilities, this is a real mystery to me. The big thing, you know, the starting point is that there is a deflation uh, in the 1580s, and this causes all kinds of problems. Uh, and it seems to feed into this kind of financial reorganization that I mentioned in passing, where there's an effort to concentrate resources at the center. But the upshot of that is that some of the provincial governors general wind up wind up with a lot of blood in the process. You, you cited a population of 12 million. Yes. And one front was being defended or uh, uh, attacked by 80,000 troops. Now, if you r put that proportionate to modern armies of the 20th century, that's a large number of people, and you consider they've got an army in the East. Yes, yes. So that's and, a huge well, the, strain the, on resources. The most amazing thing is that they were at times able to conduct significant campaigns in Hungary while engaged in a major war uh, in, in the East. Uh, but you see, the big mystery with regard to Ottoman finance is this business of the Sultan's private treasury. If you read the diplomatic, the diplomatic dispatches of the Venetians are lots of fun. They're very, very interesting. And the Venetians are very interesting in ferreting out all the information they can about the Sultan's private treasury. When I first read about this, I was wondering, well, is there really such a thing? But then I started looking at Ottoman financial historians, and there really is a private treasury. Uh, and I cannot find a lot of information about it. Rhodes Murphy, who's, who's been here for conferences at one time or another, has a reference to a nice little encyclopedia article in Turkish. And maybe I should get somebody to translate that for me. But I can't really find what, was, what happened to the Sultan's treasury. I mean, every once in a while, this again is the Venetians, usually. Sometimes Habsburg diplomats, there's a complaint that the Sultan is saying, why is not my loan paid back? The cynic would say they were made into pots. Uh, well, <laughs> well, that 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 too. So I, I think I think there's a lot of questions, but I also want to mention uh, there's there's a man named Colin Haywood uh, who's written a very interesting article uh, about ten years ago about the Ottoman border. It's in a book on borderlands, and he deals. Some of you may have heard of the so-called Ghazi thesis that I alluded to uh, in passing. This is an idea popular about you know 60, 70, 80 years ago that. The official ideology of the Ottoman Empire was the idea of the Ghazi warrior, the frontiersman who's advancing uh, the borders of Islam and so forth. And so Colin Haywood, I think, does a nice job of showing that this is really antiquated by the subsequent development of the Ottoman Empire. But he maintains uh, that the advancement of the frontiers of the empire's border, and hence the frontiers of, uh, of Islam, remains an objective of state policy until a certain time limit. And his time limit is not 
1600, but 1699, the Treaty of Karlovac, because this was the first time that the Ottomans accepted in Hungary a defined frontier. Actually, they had accepted that against the Venetians in Dalmatia a long time previously, but that was less important. So, I mean, there, you know, there, there, that, that was the argument that I was alluding to. But I, I think it's very much an open question. Yes, Michael. Oh, okay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for that. Um, so, when you were going through your discussion right at the end about whether this sort of clash of civilizations model should be applied to this uh, conflict or at least relationship between the Ottomans and the Habsburgs, that the kind of the categories that you raised and the various sort of objections that are being raised to this model were mostly from the mostly from the sort of European side of the relationship, right, in terms of how did they, you know, did they think of a sort of continual Ottoman menace, um, was Europe a common front, uh, is there a sort of European cultural unity? So obviously the question that comes to my mind is if you, you know, turn, turn that all around and try to bring some of that discussion to the Ottoman side of the, mm -hmm. of the picture, would you, and, and try to look at the sort of clash of civilizations model from the Ottoman point of view, what would you find? Well, I, I would argue that, uh, that there, uh, I, I mentioned again in passing, uh, that there, uh, well, I, I'm just sort of quoting from different Ottoman historians about different points in time. Uh, after the Sultan fights a campaign, okay, let me step back a minute. The, there, there is a development of, of Sunni orthodoxy in the Ottoman lands. It becomes more important in the 16th century as a kind of defining characteristic of what the empire means, obviously over against the Shiites in Iran. Uh, in, 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 in keeping with that, you have people like the Grand Mufti uh, issuing a declaration to the effect that fighting against heretic Shiites is more important even than fighting against infidels in the West. But the monograph that talks about that also says that in that author's the opinion, it, it really didn't fly very well with the troops because after a campaign in the East, they always wanted to fight in the West because they thought that this is really what it ought to be all about. Um, and I, I don't know, I haven't seen examples of this later on, but uh, in the, at, the, at one point in this long Turkish war, uh, the Ottomans have a very bad year. And so the next year, uh, the, uh, the Grand Vizier and the Grand Mufti and various other people go to the Sultan, who's a new Sultan. He's you know, never really been out of the harem for practical purposes, but they tell him, you've got to lead your army into Hungary, even though this hasn't been done for decades, and he agrees to do so. But he also arranges uh, to have the holy, uh, it's called the Sansaki Sharif, uh, which was believed to have been carried by, in battle by the Prophet himself, which had been moved from Mecca to Damascus earlier on. That is brought to Istanbul so it can be carried into a campaign in Hungary uh, by the Sultan. Uh, and he also, uh, there is also a mantle which is believed to have been worn by the Prophet, which is brought from Mecca to be carried into battle in Hungary. Now, it so happens that following all of this, the Ottomans win a great and unexpected victory. Uh, there is a battle in which the uh, Habsburgs seem to have defeated the Sultan and his army, and it really is a question of firepower. But what happens is that the as the Habsburg troops advance into the Sultan's camp and the Ottomans are retreating, the guys find all these treasure chests and they start dancing on the treasure chests. You know, they're just having a great old time and the Ottomans see what's going on and it gives them a chance to regroup and the result is a terrible slaughter for the Europeans and a great victory for the Ottomans. Well, in the, uh, in the Ottoman history, I mean, I can read some Ottoman histories if they're translated into Bosnian, right? Or, or, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't read Turkish and I can't read Hungarian, but I can read some things. And, and this is a high point, you see, and it's, of course, attributed to the presence of, of the standard of the prophet. So I think there was a strong sense on that side, too, of, of a conflict of this sort. Uh, one more question. Yes. Jim, then, quickly. What did, as you referred, as you discussed the, um, the European response to, or the European term for the Turks, you use the term Turks. Did, to what extent did they see them as Muslims as opposed to Turks? To what extent did the Ottomans see Iran as Shia as opposed to Safavid? Well, there, there are several questions there. I was just looking, to, I just got a book. There's a very interesting book by a guy named Michael Cook, 
uh, which is called Ancient Religions, Modern Politics. It was just reviewed recently in TLS, and he's a very distinguished uh, historian of Islam. Uh, and what he does, it's very interesting. Uh, it isn't exactly, you know, uh, 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 Huntington has this little passage about Islam's bloody borders. And I wouldn't say that Cook's book entirely deals with that, but he does address that because he wants to compare uh, the relation between traditional religion and modern politics in three cultural worlds, and he chooses the Islamic world, broadly speaking, uh, the Hindu world in India, and Catholicism in Latin America. So he doesn't talk about Europe, uh, but it's a very, very interesting book. Uh, and he has a section, and I've kind of read this before, but he's maybe a little bit clearer. First of all, on the Ottoman sense of who they were, he quotes, I had never seen this before, he quotes passages from 16th century Ottoman writers. See, the Ottomans called themselves Rumi, right? You know, they, we are the inhabitants of this Rome land, you know, where, where the Romans used to. So we are Rumi. That's what we are. And he quotes a passage from a 16th century Ottoman writer who uses the word Turk to mean those illiterate cousins out there in Anatolia. You see, we're not, we're not Turks, you know, we're not, we're not this. Uh, so there, there's a real difference between being an Ottoman and being a Turk. The Europeans pick up on that, uh, and they will sometimes, you know, the, the general European prejudice, if, if I can kind of generalize, is that the worst kind of Turk is a fake Turk. You know, someone who's not a real Turk. I even found in a Dutch source, Ray, the word Ras echte Turke. I mean a racially genuine Turk. Now these people are bad, but they're not as bad as the other guys. So they're aware of that difference too, but they generally call everybody Turks, nonetheless. As regards Iran, I, I'm not in the position to help very much. I mean, it's amazing to me, there's so little literature. I mean, I should read Sinem uh, Archok's dissertation. I'm sure there's more in there than in the books that I know about. There is a book. There's not a lot about those identity. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Well, I think that's a very interesting question. You know, uh, the, the, from what I've read, uh, they, are, they are Shiites. You know, that's, that's why they're problematic. And it starts, you know, with the recruitment of the, of the tribes in Anatolia and so forth. That's already kind of a threat. That's one reason that Salem the I uh, uh, kicks his father off the throne, because he doesn't think his father is reacting to this problem strongly enough. Well, we are free to continue with Jim informally. Uh, we have uh, a reception that is now served, and there are beverages, and I hope you'll all stay a bit and join in this celebration of 30 years and still going with the Con Memorial. Thank you.